Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm going to be talking about diets, keto diets or low carb diets, and giving you some data that is the truth about how these diets tend to fail. And I know that's not necessarily what you want to hear from me, but I've got a specific paper that I'm referring to, and I'm very, very thankful uh, to a friend of mine, Dr. Zoe Harkum, H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E. Um, and Zoe puts out, uh, she lives in the UK, she's a dietitian, statistician, worked with Dr. Prof Noakes um, at his exoneration trial and the trial of LCHF. But Zoe puts out a Monday newsletter that is absolutely exceptional. She is a dietary statistician, so she'll take a paper, break it down, give you the good and the bad, give you the biases, and she's just phenomenal in terms of her work. And I learn so much from her every Monday. So this is a, um, a, a newsletter that she put out at the beginning of this, uh, this year, and it's about an article that was published in uh, the U.S. Diet Fits Study, as part of the U.S. Diet Fits Study, in which um, a group of people were randomized of overweight people, BMI of 33. So these are obese people that were randomized to either a low carbohydrate, high a low carbohydrate diet, they call it healthy low carbohydrate, or healthy high fat diet. And they were intense for the first um, a few weeks of the diet, and then they could bump things up just a little bit, and they tracked them for a year. And the diet started off genuinely low carb and low fat for eight weeks. Now, in eight weeks, you can't even fat adapt. So it is an ultra short period of time where they limited the consumption of carbohydrates and fat to 20 grams in each arm. Now, folks, as you know, with human studies, uh, I'll just tell you a little anecdote. I was flying to Seattle before COVID and I was sitting next to this enormous guy. And I was working on my talk, so I, I, he knew that I did obesity work, and we started chatting, and it's a four, four, four and a half hour flight, and we're chatting about stuff, and um, the little lady comes along, the flight attendant comes along, and offers us that little basket. So I'm having uh, black coffee, so she pours me a cup of black coffee, he looks over, and he reaches over, and he grabs those little Delta cinnamon biscotti packs, I think there's three or four biscottis in them. If you know, um, you've got a problem. You shouldn't know because you shouldn't be eating them. Be that as it may, if you've got the answer, you're probably a carb addict. But he leans over, he grabs one, and um, uh, we're chatting. And about every 20 minutes, she comes by, she offers him, he grabs another one, and she tops up my coffee. And at the end of the flight, we had a great conversation about obesity and carb addiction and the whole deal. Nice guy. And I turned to him and I said, by the way, how many of those little biscuit packages did you have? And I said, well, I just had one. Now, folks, I counted. I know he had eight. He had eight packs. So when he said he had one, was he lying to me? And the answer is no, he wasn't. He wasn't lying. But that's what we do. We do what we do at a subconscious level, and we don't count how often we're doing things. So he knew that he ate those biscuits, but he had no idea. He had no clue about what he was actually doing. Now, now you say, that's, that's a bit bizarre, that's crazy. But I can tell you, as a corollary to that, I have no idea how much coffee I drank. I know she topped up my cup by cup every time she came by. I know I drank a lot of coffee. I have no idea how much. There's no difference between the two. I would be lying to you if I told you how much I thought I had. Because I don't know. And, and why did I take that little segue? Because when it comes to self-reporting of what people are eating and drinking, we are not rats in cages. And that same methodology comes to play. We're oblivious to it, or we minimize and trivialize and rationalize and ignore certain things that we're doing. So to say that somebody ate 20 grams of fat or 20 grams of carbohydrates, occasionally it may be true. Under the best self-reporting conditions, however, and in my patient population, on the studies that we've done, it is impossible to truly evaluate caloric consumption. Having said that, and that, that makes all these studies so difficult to do. However, at the end of 12 months on the study, the low-carb dieters had averaged 30% carbohydrate intake. So 30% of their calories were carbohydrates. 
and the low-fat dieters had about 30% of fat in their diet. So both groups had tended back to a more balanced diet, even though they were in the study assigned to specific categories. I hate that word balanced. But they were unable to sustain in the course of less than a year the fundamental properties of a low-carbohydrate or low-fat diet. And that's because they have access to food with carbohydrates. And I defy most of you to eat three chips from a bag, to eat one scoop of ice cream, to leave some mashed potatoes on your plate, to only eat 20% of your carbohydrates as pasta. That is the lunacy of structured diets. In the addiction model, you don't have to know how much carbohydrate there is in something. No alcoholic knows how much alcohol there is in a drink. But they absolutely know in a binary way, yes or no. No, I can't drink that because it contains alcohol, ir ir irrespective of how much that alcohol is. Yes, I can drink this because it contains no, uh, uh, um, no alcohol. No smoker knows what the nicotine or tar content is of their cigarettes. And smoking light cigarettes is still smoking. Drinking a light beer is still drinking. But we try to control these diets at 20% carbohydrate. Lunacy. And that's 20% going in your mouth. Well, if it's in vegetables, maybe you're pooping those vegetables, vegetable, vegetables out. Maybe we don't even have the capacity to extract them. Who knows? Well, we do know. But that makes these diet categories irrational to begin with. However, what's amazing is that by 12 months, all these people in a 12-month study heavily, heavily managed from a behavioral perspective, from every perspective, continuous interaction with their monitors still return to an old way of eating because of the presence of carbohydrates and fat in their diet. Now, what was interesting is that adherence to the diet didn't affect weight loss. That's a bit bizarre, isn't it? Because they returned to that average, really what mattered, and, and on average they lost about 11 pounds, with men in the low-carb group being the greatest and women in the low-carb group being the worst. I don't want to go sexist on that. There are ways to explain that. But the difference in weight loss was not explainable by adherence. Isn't that a bit bizarre? However, global caloric intake did fall through the study. So they did drop their caloric content. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at the construction of calorie-reduced diets, and there's something, I just want to turn to the page over here, there's something called the 3,500-calorie 3, theory. If you looked at the reduction in their caloric consumption based on that theory, which is a very popular theory for calculating calories in your portions, the average weight loss should have been around 60 pounds based on that theory. But the average weight loss was only 11 pounds over the course of a year, despite that reduction in caloric consumption. So clearly, the calorie reduction theory does not work. And every diet, every diet out there is based on the principle of some form of elimination or global caloric reduction. And that theory by this paper was completely disproved. After two months, participants gradually increased their daily carbohydrate intake. They were allowed to. They were not given any explicit caloric information. But just by virtue of being on the diet, they did eat less. With the healthy, low-carb dieters producing significantly greater weight loss and loss of fat and, and lean muscle, lean muscle mass, than the healthy, low-fat diet in men but not in women. And that's a very concerning statistic. These folks lost a significant amount of lean muscle mass. 
Now, maybe they didn't need those muscles anymore to support the extra weight, but 11 pounds is not that much. And that's concerning for me. Because typically what we want to do is preserve lean muscle mass and lose fat. But that didn't necessarily happen here. They lost fat and lean muscle mass. Adherence to the diet did not affect that weight loss. Men on the healthy, low-carb, and women on the healthy, low-carb women uh, 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 categories were the most and least adherent of all the groups, respectively. So the men adhered the best, the women adhered the worst, both in the low-carb category. And that difference was statistically significant between the groups, but not within the group, which is kind of a bit bizarre as well. So the point of this study and about this this paper is that calories are less important. Calories are less important in terms of weight loss, sustainable weight loss over a year, than hormonal regulation, than cyclical hormonal regulation. But on average on these diets, the people were only able to lose one pound per month. One pound per month over a 12-month period. Now, you know, if, you've, if you're slightly overweight, 10, 12 pounds is a great number to lose. But if you've got more than 100 pounds to lose, that is not an effective amount of weight loss. And that is a big concern for diets. This is about as invasive a study, apart from keep, keeping people under lockdown, that is done in the dietary world. So if you think, okay, I see if you're a dietitian or if you're a counselor uh, uh, using a keto diet to help your patients, oh, your belief in that keto diet is far greater than the results you are going to achieve at one year with the people you are counseling. Because you're trying to get them to control tightly control a relationship they do not have the capacity to control in the face of huge emotional adversity. And here's actually something interesting that um, did come out of this paper. And it's an interesting concept because it is a true concept. And I'm going to talk about this in another video about how to help people that you care about adopt a ketogenic way of life. And I know this may seem a little sexist, but it's the way that the paper panned out, is that the motivation for women to lose weight was more about looking and feeling better than it was about health and health fear. So that by losing their weight, they expected to gain a better look and to feel better. But the men were typically driven by pain as a motivator. What do we mean by pain? The fear of disease, the fear of a heart attack, the fear of a stroke, the fear of hypertension, the fear of diabetes, the fear of losing a limb, the fear of Alzheimer's. And I think this is very relevant in that pain is a far more effective motivator than gain. Pain is a more effective motivator than gain. The fear of something awful happening is a far better motivator than the abstract gain of looking and feeling better. And that was a very interesting comment that came from this paper. And Zoe breaks it down really well. I would urge you to follow this. But this for me is categorical absolute proof that in one of the best conducted ketogenic type studies out there, People weren't successful at one year. And these are people that typically, have an, if they're going to live to 100, have about 50 to 60 years of life left. How well are they going to do over the next 50 to 60 years? Because this only works when you're doing it. It's an Eric Westman quote. So these diets do not work because slowly people return to the old way of doing business with minor modifications. And if you're satisfied with those minor modifications, that's okay. I'm not. I'm not. And I know that we can do better as counselors, as therapists, as dietitians when we use an addiction 
methodology. Recognizing that our patients do not have the capacity long-term to control their relationship with carbohydrates, and therefore removal and replacement as a methodology works much better, not perfectly, but works much better than a deprivational model. When you find other ways to manage your emotional needs, rather than snacking and consuming carbohydrates, the result is more likely to be more dramatic and more sustained. And helping people to understand the concept of carbohydrate addiction as opposed to caloric reduction by some methodology such as a low-carb or a low-fat diet. And the concept of permission, that once I start eating a certain way, I can't stop. And it slowly gets worse and worse and worse until it levels off at a certain plateau. That's the concern. So the methodology about how you manage and how you counsel your patients is probably more important than the specifics of what it is that you're eliminating. Whether you're eliminating fat or sugar is less important than helping people to understand their addiction. And the addiction is never to fat. It's exclusively to sugar and starch. If you want to learn more about the carbohydrate addiction uh, model, if you're a practitioner or a person struggling, I want to change out of being an expert at failing weight loss programs to being someone that enters a carbohydrate addiction program. Give us a shout. Look at the rest of the videos on this channel, especially the early ones, specifically on carb addiction. They're incredibly valuable to my mind. But also set up a consult. Text us or WhatsApp us to 561-517-0642 and hit the subscribe button if you don't mind. These videos drop on a regular basis, and there's more to come along the lines of these studies. But if anything, this study, this U.S. Diet Fits study, U.S.-D-I-E-T-F-I-T-S study, is demonstration that any form of elimination, any form of caloric reduction, does not work sustainably. Unless you only want to lose 11 pounds. Made you think, I hope. But maybe reconsider the methodology you use when you change behavior. See you next time. I am the Carb Addiction Doc.